Late on Saturday, December the 4th, 1861, Albert, the Prince Consort, died suddenly and unexpectedly at the age of 42. Queen Victoria was inconsolable, preserving his bedroom as a private shrine. Her people were shocked by the loss of this pious family man and worthy prince who had worked so hard to make himself loved. Scarcely had he been laid to rest before people in towns and cities up and down the country were considering how best to commemorate him. In the small Yorkshire town of Queensbury, the Foster family combined a much needed public fountain with this striking memorial. In Manchester, the memorial became the focal point of a major urban development around the renamed Albert Square. But of course, the National Memorial in London was going to have to be the grandest and most elaborate monument of them all. The purpose of the memorial is explicitly stated in the mosaic text below the gables. You can tell immediately from the sheer size and the lavishness of the decoration just how important Albert's memory was to the people who commissioned it and organized the 150,000 pounds to pay for it. What they bought has become probably the most evocative monument of mid-Victorian Britain. It was also arguably the most important sculptural commission of the 19th century. But just because it's so familiar, we have to be specially careful how we read it. That's to say, we need to try and unravel some of the reasons for choosing the style of architecture, the decoration, the various groups of sculpture. What do they show? And how are they all organized and to convey what sorts of meaning? We could begin by asking what it is. For a start, it's not a chapel or a tomb. Albert's body is buried in the specially constructed Royal Mausoleum at Frogmore near Windsor. Like the Manchester Memorial, this whole structure has no explicit function, beyond being a memorial to the prince. And since it is a memorial to an individual, it's hardly surprising that the centerpiece is a portrait statue. The facial likeness is striking. But what about the rest of the figure? How important is the costume and the pose? The original sculptor, Marochetti, experimented with a statue of the prince in uniform on horseback, like the statue of the Duke of Wellington erected at Marble Arch 10 years earlier, or this famous 15th century example called the Gatta Melata in Padua, sculpted by Donatello. This type was later used for the Albert Memorial in Edinburgh, but perhaps was felt to be too exclusively military for the London Memorial. Instead, Albert is portrayed sitting, dressed in the historical robes of a Knight of the Garter. Although entirely honorific, the Garter was nonetheless the highest honor in the land, bestowed by the monarch personally. There was a long tradition of seated poses in memorial sculpture, like this one for Pope Innocent VIII in St. Peter's, Rome. Michelangelo had also used it for the secular tombs of the Medici in Florence, combining the image of the general with the pose of the philosopher. An apt description of the late prince. But unlike Lorenzo, Albert is shown leaning forward with one leg actually stepping down. Described in the contemporary guidebook as suggesting that special intelligence which indicates an active, rather than a passive interest in those pursuits of civilization illustrated in the accompanying figures. Nonetheless, both Marochetti and his successor Foley admitted it was going to be difficult to make a seated figure sufficiently imposing. 
The statue was originally helped by being gilded. The flowing robes also helped to give the seated figure extra bulk. But much of its heroic quality comes from its sheer size. And remember, the scale of any carved figure is important because we tend to relate figures of humans to the human scale. The figure of Albert is colossal. He'd be 19 feet high if he were standing up. Seated, the figure is impressive without being overpowering. It's a pose that would show him as regal and masterly, presiding rather than triumphing over the figures that surround him. This complex of meanings is extended by various details, like the book in the prince's hand, on whose cover is a picture of the Crystal Palace, home of the Great Exhibition, celebrated as the prince's greatest, almost his sole achievement. Despite the obvious importance of the portrait statue, it was an architect and not a sculptor who was chosen to design the memorial. Indeed, since only seven architects were invited to submit designs, it's clear from the start that sculpture was seen as additional or subservient to architecture, as in P.C. Hardwick's palatial complex. Charles Barry designed a great classical hall, recalling the grandeur of imperial Rome. But in the end, the Queen selected George Gilbert Scott's design, the only Gothic one submitted. Although 11 different sculptors were involved, because architecture was seen to be more important, we should look first at the implications of Scott's use of Gothic. As the building style of the medieval church, Gothic commemorated Albert as a traditional Christian prince. The shape of the monument is similar to the rich reliquaries made for medieval abbeys and cathedrals, like this monstrance acquired by the South Kensington Museum in 1858. There's no proof that Scott actually saw this monstrance, but there was no shortage of 19th century Gothic precedents which could have influenced him. The romantic Gothic monument to Sir Walter Scott in Edinburgh, built in 1836. Then there was Scott's own design for the Protestant Martyrs Memorial in Oxford, completed in 1841. the figures of the 16th century martyrs fill their Gothic niches like statues of medieval saints. Rather as Albert does in Hyde Park. But apart from these religious associations, the actual impression conveyed by the Gothic style is one of sumptuous decoration. Even high up, where it can never properly be seen by the public, it's clear that an awful lot of money has been spent on this memorial. Worked into the general richness of the Gothic are Albert's initials, his motto. And on the underside of the canopy, both the princes and the queen's coats of arms, reinforcing the supposed traditions of medieval chivalry suggested by the statue's garter robes. These associations were apparently enjoyed and encouraged by Albert and Victoria on occasions like the 1842 costume ball commemorated by the artist Landseer. The sumptuous decoration continues on the monument in the four mosaic-filled gables celebrating the arts of architecture, painting, poetry and music, and sculpture. Although they sit on Gothic thrones, allegorical figures representing arts like these properly belong to the classical tradition. The architecture of the monument may be Gothic, but the figures are not. And neither is the way they are presented. 
Mosaic was a material more usually associated with ancient Roman or Byzantine art. But by using it, Scott was able to introduce large areas of colour onto his apparently medieval memorial. The figures of Phidias, designer of the Parthenon in Athens, and Michelangelo, leading sculptor of the High Renaissance, are set in shrines as impersonal ideals on either side of sculpture's throne. The four mosaics in the gables celebrate in an abstract way the prince's associations with the arts. But those associations are personalized by the frieze of 169 life-size figures, including Michelangelo, which surround the whole base of the memorial. The complete frieze was supposed to depict the most eminent artists of all the ages of the world. Architects and sculptors, painters, poets and musicians. When there is sunshine, the white Sicilian marble contrasts boldly with the red granite, though it's become badly stained by polluted rainwater draining from the monument. The figures are mostly carved in high relief, and each one of the 169 is an individual portrait, carefully distinguished by dress, pose and face, as well as being named and, sometimes, like Michelangelo, by holding a model of one of their most famous works. This kind of individualization was fine for depicting the painter Ingres, since he only died in 1867, photographs of him were available. And one of Goethe's friends advised on his appearance. But most of the subjects were artists from previous centuries, so the carved likenesses had to be taken from other likenesses. And stereotyped depictions of Shakespeare's beard or Beethoven's brooding passion can hardly be called portraits in any real sense. No likeness at all has survived of the Greek sculptor Phidias, and we don't even know the names of the Assyrian and Egyptian masters. Nevertheless, each one has been personalized, creating a false but powerful image of intimacy and continuity with the past. The only living artist on the frieze was Scott himself, there by royal command. The selection of all the other artistic heroes, like Homer, was apparently left to the designers. And since most of the surviving criticism doesn't relate to that selection, presumably their pantheon represents contemporary taste. And this is revealing. Of the 38 painters on the frieze, 15 represent the Italian Renaissance, with Raphael, a particular favorite of Prince Albert's, enthroned in the center. That's not altogether surprising. But there are also some strange omissions. Botticelli, for instance. This unconscious discrimination is an indication of the sort of changes in taste that are always occurring. And I think that sometimes there are other, more conscious factors at work. The great Turner is given pride of place on the corner of the monument. But his contemporary and rival constable isn't shown at all. Instead, there's the less well-known Wilkie, then Reynolds, Gainsborough, Hogarth, masters of the 18th century. But where's Van Dyck? Well, we don't have any documentary proof, but could it be that as the great portraitist of Catholic Stuart Court, he was suspect in Protestant, democratic Victorian Britain? Or maybe there was just no room for more British painters. By his association with the greatest artists, Albert is commemorated as patron of the arts. But it's not as simple as that as we saw earlier. The relative size of Albert's statue and its placing means that it appears to preside over the figures of the frieze, implying perhaps that Albert's achievements should be seen as greater than theirs. It's these possible hidden meanings that we have to be aware of as we look at the rest of the sculpture on the monument.
as well as the more obvious references. Beginning at the top with the cross, the different groups of sculptures are organized to create an impossibly idealized image of Albert. A rank of angels reaches towards heaven and a second rank extend their benedictions to the earth below, bereft now of Albert. Below the cross and angels are eight figures of virtues. In the central niches, faith, hope, charity and humility, and on the corners, moral virtues, temperance, prudence, justice and fortitude. These next figures represent something rather less spiritual. Set on the corners, there are two tiers of bronze statues symbolizing the sciences. Although they are supposed to represent Albert's real interests in the 19th century, they're still portrayed as classical female allegorical figures, but identified this time by suitably modern attributes, like the retort for chemistry. Mind you, the fact that each one had to be labeled too, this is geology, suggests a lack of confidence in the viewer's ability to read this kind of symbolism. The next groups of sculptures, in marble, present the cornerstones of the Victorian world of work and business. Engineering, commerce, agriculture, and manufactures. The obligatory allegorical female figure is now surrounded by real-life exponents of these valuable practical skills. Though manufacture displays metalwork, textiles, and ceramics, indisputably key trades of the 19th century, it's impossible to see this boy as a realistic image of child labor of the time. While the statue of the smith owes more to classical images of Hercules than to life in a foundry, where going barefoot seems hardly practical. The designers were trying to express idealized concepts, but it's very difficult to give a recognizable shape to a concept. For commerce, you can start with the cornucopia, the classical symbol of the horn of plenty. Then, if this man with the sack of corn can be seen as the provider of the necessities of life, the casket presumably represents the luxury trade. But what about the man offering it? Why is he so obviously a foreigner? As a reminder, perhaps, that many British luxuries came from her empire? The figure of the merchant is difficult to read, too. He's obviously a youth, perhaps to suggest the energy and enthusiasm needed to succeed in commerce. He's identified by a ledger, a purse of money, and by this balance for weighing and valuing coins. But I find the pseudo-medieval costume quite unconvincing, and I suspect this fancy dress has far more to do with 19th century ideas about art than commerce. But if the groups that illustrated the contemporary world were difficult to design, the final freestanding groups were far more problematic. They associate the prince with the whole of mankind by illustrating the four quarters of the globe, from Africa to America, from Asia to Europe. An extravagant gesture born of a Victorian confidence or need to see the European way of life as the only true form of civilization. These are the only parts of the memorial that can be completely seen in the round. So the formal sculptural relationship of the various figures is particularly important. And only Foley's design for Asia received universal praise at the time. It's clearly more compact and pyramidal than the others. And from ground level, the life-size natives fit well with the figure of India on the elephant, who is actually substantially larger than them but doesn't appear oppressively different. The choice of the elephant for Asia was clearly determined by its importance as a working animal for the British Raj in India. At the time, 
there was most difficulty over the design of the Africa group. A utilitarian camel eventually replaced the wild lion that was originally planned. But the group still doesn't completely conform to the pyramidal shape of Asia. Even though it was entirely North American, sculpturally and symbolically, the wild buffalo being tamed was a good choice for America. This group was supposed to represent the advance of civilization in the whole continent. Yet significantly, the figure for South America is a Spanish conquistador, and he's hardly advancing at all. An unconscious piece of prejudice, perhaps? Like this Europeanized token Indian? And either side of the buffalo, the USA and Canada, are symbolized by European-style female figures. Similar to the figures of Britain, Germany, Italy, and France, including the classical nymph Europa on her bull. All these figures are crowned, significant, said a contemporary description, of the influence which our quarter of the globe has exercised over the others. But I feel that political considerations have caused the designer of this group real problems. The figures are isolated, and the whole group looks awkward, with Britain and France facing determinedly away from each other. Their position at the head of the group may have been a fair perception of the political reality of the time, but it was hardly a compliment to a German prince. In the end, I think it's a measure of the skill of the architect and the 11 sculptors that despite all the problems, the whole thing fits together as well as it does. In that sense at least, this is clearly a work of quality. But it's the hidden agenda of social and historical references, the unwitting testimony, that makes this monument so interesting. The message seemed simple to start with, a respectable monument to a dead prince but the implications are something else. All the Christian virtues, art, architecture, sculpture, and music, a whole range of sciences, commerce, agriculture, engineering, manufactures. We can hardly be expected to believe that Albert himself actually had all those virtues, appreciated all that art, or influenced the whole world. Besides, by the time it was finished, he'd been dead 15 years. Behind all the implied homage to Albert is a belief in the excellence of the civilization pervaded by Britain and personified in the image of the late noble prince. This immensely costly monument was not so much a memorial to a dead prince as a complex message of national pride built out of the aspirations, ambitions, and prejudices of Victorian Britain in the 1860s.